So today we look at offenses. Offenses. Then next week we'll look at the art of forgiveness. The art of forgiveness. Today offenses. Luke chapter 17 verse 1 to 4. Luke 17 verse 1 to 4. He said, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone will hang about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So first of all, there's a big word here, offend. To offend. Uh, what does it mean to offend? What is an offense? An offense is when you do something that is wrong. If you look at an offense in a, when it's not related to anybody, an offense in the society is doing something that is not acceptable. Something that is considered against the law, against the normal way of doing things. To offend a person is to do something that makes the person angry, to hurt someone's feelings, or to cause him displeasure. So, we know this. When we say he has offended me, we know what we mean. We mean, this something to me that I don't like. He treated me the way I don't like. Either he said something to you you didn't like, or the way he did something you didn't like it. It's an offense. So, an offense is when someone displeases you. Now, but I want us to look at many other words. There are many other words that surround the idea of, of being offended. And there's a Bible passage that lists several of those words. Ephesians 4 verse 31. Ephesians 4 verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So in that passage, you see all kinds of words. And all of them are still talking about offense. The first one there, we, say, we see bitterness. Bitterness comes from bitter. And it's something that is taken from when you put something in your mouth that is bitter, the way you feel. When you see somebody put something in his mouth and the thing is bitter, the expression on his eyes, the expression on his face, the reaction of the body, the feeling in the tummy, is almost the same thing with when you have that feeling towards someone. When you feel offended, your body reacts almost the same way with when you taste something that is bitter in your mouth. So it's having an experience that is not pleasant. It's all that when you don't feel pleasant towards someone, you are bitter. And sometimes bitterness in itself may not look loud. It may be quiet. It may be you that is feeling it. People may look at you. They may not notice it. But it's there. And if you don't deal with the bitterness, it will grow into anger. In Colossians chapter 3 verse 19, Colossians 3 19. He says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Be not bitter against them. You know, we can't talk about all these relationships without including the issue of marriage because it's actually the closest of relationships. So when you love your wives, don't be bitter against them. Don't have those ill feelings towards them. Don't allow, you know, unpleasant feelings to develop in your heart towards your wife. So those unpleasant feelings is what we are talking about, describing as bitterness. If you have those unpleasant feelings towards anybody and you don't deal with them, very soon you are going to behave wrongly towards that person. James chapter 3 verse 14. James 3 verse 14. But if ye have bitter envy 
and strife in your heart. Glory not and lie not against the truth. You know, it shows here that bitterness is actually in the heart. It's, it lies down in the heart. You know, sometimes you may not express it, but it's there. And depending on your personality, um, there are people who are, who are passive. They are passive in their, in their behaviors. So when, when they begin to have bitterness in their heart towards you, what people like that do is that they will be keeping quiet, they will be keeping quiet. They are feeling it all. They will not begin to withdraw. They practice withdrawal. They will just withdraw from the person. But when they don't deal with that, that one offend them, they withdraw. That one offend them, they withdraw. That one offend them. After some time, they become lonely. They are dying inside. But because they are passive people, they don't like offending another person. And they are tired of being offended. So they just pull back, pull back. But they are suffering inside. There are those who are passive aggressive. Passive aggressive people can be passive for some time. But the day they will explode, when they reach their breaking point, they explode. You hear them, they will say, you know me, I don't get angry on time. But when I get angry, eh? So, those kind of people, the day they explode, everybody will be like, eh? This one, we thought he didn't know how to talk. He knows how to talk. It's just that, like they say, if you, if you, even a goat can bite if you disturb it too much. Then we have people who are, who are very aggressive people. Aggressive people, <laughs> they are the ones that offend other people very easily. Because their own attitude is that I don't hide my feelings. Me, I don't hide my feelings. And they are very proud of themselves. They look at passive people as hypocrites. Then you offend them, they give it to you. And they give it to you hot, hot. They don't even care whether you're offended afterwards. They give it to you. They'll tell you that I don't hide my feelings. Me, I speak my mind. Uh, you <laughs> so, very, very aggressive people. And when you offend them, when they talk like that, after they leave the place, they are forgotten about it too. As far as they are concerned, they have dealt with the matter. As the way they reacted, they spoke their mind, blah, 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 they go away from that place. When you start talking about it, say, eh? You mean you are still keeping that thing in your mind? You know me, oh, once I spend, I say my mind, I'm okay. I'm okay. You are okay, but the person you gave it to is not okay. <laughs> so, I've already jumped to another topic now. So we have aggressive, passive, then the people in the middle, passive, aggressive. So which one is the correct thing? The correct thing is assertiveness. To assert yourself. To assert yourself, you think about your feelings, you think about the feelings of the other person, you deal with your anger, and then you express your mind without hurting. Let's leave that for another day. But bitterness, if you don't deal with it quickly, it begins to move to other things. The anger, like I said, anger comes, there are in stages. There are in stages. Feeling of being injured, trespass against. It's the same thing that causes bitterness, that causes anger. But now bitterness is manifesting. Anger and wrath are they are twin brothers. You know, anger. You may be angry and not show it also. But wrath, ah, you're already manifesting the anger. When you are giving it to them, when you are showing your displeasure, you are showing your anger, then you are already mad. So anger, you could be angry. Someone can even read it on you that you are angry, but you don't you hold it. But when you begin to exhibit it, when you begin to show that you are angry, then you have moved to wrath. Wrath is when you begin to express your anger. Ephesians 4.26 Be ye angry and say not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So you can see that anger in itself, you can be angry, but if you don't allow it to manifest, you are still control. You are still under control. And it says... You shouldn't allow the sun to go down your wrath. Even if you express anger, you should quickly also bring it under control. Because there are situations that, you, as human beings, you just have to express uh, how you feel. Colossians 3, verse 8. Colossians 3, verse 8. But now he also put off all this anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication 
out of your mouth. God expects us to take charge of our feelings. There's a, a book that was very helpful to me several years ago. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, written by a man called Steve Covey. Many of the principles in that, bo- in that book are actually biblical principles. And he said something that initially has, has trouble to understand it. He said, nobody can make you angry without your permission. He said, you are a human being and you have the power of choice. So somebody can slap you. He has done it. You can feel the pain. You don't have a choice on that. But how you react to that anger, to that slap, is your choice. So when you say, he is the one that made me angry. No, nobody makes you angry. You decided to be angry. You are only responding to a stimuli. And when he started explaining scientifically, I could understand that way. If somebody, for an animal, wants to, or when is the animal part of you, if somebody takes a pin, comes behind your back, and pinch you, you are going to react. Is that not? That's a natural response to stimulus. But if somebody says something to you, nothing says that you must also say back. If somebody insults you, nobody forces you to also insult back you make that choice so when you make that choice you don't come back and say the person made you to do it yes you made a choice there is a, a power of choice you are responsible for your action so anger is a reaction that's why the bible says they say put off anger malice wrath blasphemy filthy communication put it off take charge of your response to what people do to you. It talks about clamor. Clamor is when you have already started quarreling. Boisterous expressions of anger. When you are already speaking harsh words. You know, you are already very harsh. You are already shouting. You are already screaming. You know, saying things that eventually you will regret. For some, I mean, Second Samuel 19 verse 43. Second Samuel 19 verse 43 talks about a, a time in the land of Judah when there was a crisis. There's a phrase there that I want us to pick. And the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. They were exchanging fierce words. Fierce words. Angry words. Shouting at each other. This one argue, this one shout back, that one insult, this one insult back. <laughs> I remember in those days. You say, see your head like coconut. Say, you see your own like balloon. You know, when he says one thing, you two, you find another one you say to the person. You know, say they no bone your mama where you they no bone your papa where you know all kinds of things. So what they give you, you give back. Proverbs 29 verse 22. Proverbs 22 verse 29, 22. An angry man stir it up strife, and a furious man abounded in transgression. These are components of anger. Evil speaking. Evil speaking may not be in an angry tone, but it's still evil speaking. Once you are saying something that is offensive, something that is offensive against another person, whether in their presence or behind their person, with the intention to hurt, you are already speaking evil of them. Especially you are saying things you know are not true, and even when you are saying something that is true, but saying it with the wrong motive, then... We are already speaking evil against people. Psalm 50 verse 20, Psalm 50 verse 20. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thy own mother's son. First Timothy 5 verse 13. First Timothy 5 verse 13. And with that they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tacklers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. You know, the Bible describes these people. If it was happening at the time of Paul, then you know it's happening now. Now we have gone beyond just going from house to house. We go from chat room to chat room. We start on Facebook, we move to Instagram, we go to Twitter, you know, to Threads, to TikTok, to every Snapchat, anything available. You know, I have spoken to myself and said, I think I've done enough. Let me leave the rest for children to be doing. I can't be on every platform that comes up. You know, and 
now they are helping you to link everything so that when you post in one platform it automatically posts in everywhere you, that you are you know spreading to help you to spread it to spread it to spread it so evil speaking evil speaking these days is in the air second peter first peter 2 verse 1 first peter 2 verse 1 we are for laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. Say so we should lay them aside. Lay them aside. You have a responsibility to lay them aside. Malice is a word we use very regularly. You know, malice, say you are bearing malice. Malice is that you are angry and you are looking for an opportunity to revenge. That is when it becomes malice. That's why in legal terms we hear about malicious intention. When you do something and they say you didn't do it innocently, you did it deliberately to hurt this person and you had a reason for doing it. Malicious intention. Malice is a disposition to injure others because of what they did to you. you know, and that is something that is very common. First Peter, I mean First Corinthians 5 is 8. First Corinthians 5 is 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth remember we studied the leaven of the pharisees i would say it's the impurity leaven is an impurity so malice is now put in the category of leaven impure things things that are from the old life they are not things that are part of our new life in christ it's part of our old life when we are under the control of the devil. So we are not to serve God with malice. No, no. Malice must be kept away. First Corinthians 14 verse 20. First Corinthians 14 verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Why did they say you should be malice in you should in, in malice you should be children? Because children don't keep grudges, they don't keep malice. Once it happens there, they finish their fight, they are forgotten about it. The next moment they are playing together, they are embracing themselves, they are, they are forgotten about what happened yesterday. It's as we grow older that we begin to keep malice. So in malice, be like children. When people offend you, don't keep malice in your heart. Titus 3, verse 3. Titus 3, verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That's our life before before. It's not supposed to be part of this present life we are in anymore. Children of God should keep that away. It is part of our former life. It's not accepted in our new life to live in malice and envy, to be hateful and to be hating one another. There's an example there, Second Samuel 13, verse 22 to 32. Second Samuel 13, 22 to 32. It's a story of uh, Absalom. Absalom had a, had a brother called Amnon. Amnon and, they had, and, and, and a sister, a sister called Tamar. So Amnon raped Tamar. The sister raped her. You know, and Absalom was very, very angry. But if you look at verse 20, you say, Absalom spake unto his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad. He didn't say anything to him. Good or bad, nothing. Kept in his heart. He planned what he was going to do. Verse 23, he said, and it came to pass after two full years. Can you understand that? Two years passed. The guy was patient in his malice. And there are people like that. You offend them, you can even think they have forgotten about it. They will be eating with you, laughing with you, playing with you. They are waiting for the day they will strike. That's ungodly. And the day this boy was going to strike, his brother Amno did not even think that Absalom still had a, a matter in his mind. Organized a feast, made sure that everybody came and slaughtered Amno there. Yeah. You know, that's, that's resentment. Resentment is similar to malice. You know, it's just in your heart. You don't have to have anything to do with this person anymore. Because you have been wronged. You have been maltreated. You have been betrayed. Strife. 
Strife is when it is an active manifestation of offense. It's ongoing. It is perversive. It is you know, quarrels, divisive behavior. Where you are no longer greeting each other, you are no longer talking to each other peacefully, you don't want to associate with them again. That is a full blown strife. But all this, they come, they are all part of offenses. They can start small and grow. If it is happening in a community, this is the point where these days we will even take guns against each, against each other, take cutlasses against each other. If it's in the church, sometimes they are no longer even you know, greeting some people, they are no longer talking, they are already praying. They are in different camps, calling fire upon one another, you know, in the church. Second Corinthians 12, verse 20. Second Corinthians 12, verse 20. For I, for I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not, lest there be debates, envy, rots, stripes, backbitings, whispering, swellings, tumults. Say, look, I'm hoping that when I come, oh, it's not that when I come, people have already scattered, scattered the whole church. Second Timothy 2, verse 23. Second Timothy 2, 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender stripes. Then gender stripes. So when you get to the point of strife, I'm trying to just help us think about the words, the different words that, or things that can be described as offense. Now what is the source of offense? What are the sources of offenses? One, even from our normal natural engagements of life, disagreements are bound to come and they can bring offense. Luke chapter 17 verse 1, where we took our text, Luke 17 verse 1 says, offenses will surely come. Offenses will come. It's impossible. They must just come. Disagreements, arguments, because we don't see things the same. We don't see things. Sometimes even you as a human being, you alone, you quarrel with yourself. Is it not true? Yes. You quarrel with yourself. You do things and then you see, why did I do something like that? You are not talking about another person. Now you do them. Now you they fight yourself, say so you do them. Why did I even sort talk like that? You get angry with yourself. So now we talk of your fellow brother or your fellow sister. So from normal, natural uh, engagements of life, we have different approaches. When uh, an issue comes up, this one says we should go this way, this one says we should go this way. Those, those are normal disagreements. So from our normal relationship in life, they are bound to be offenses. It is how we manage it that is the important thing. How we manage this as important thing. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Acts 6, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples were must, was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were rejected, neglected in the daily ministration. You know, the church was beginning to enlarge. And you know, if you read back in Acts chapter 4, they were bringing everything they had together. You know, there were people, they were selling their lands in chapter 5. And Ananias brought his own, they were distributing. That good thing they were doing became a source of problem. The Grecians, who are the Grecians? The Grecians were the, the Jews who, who came from, from outside Israel. The Jews who had lived outside Israel. They, were, they, they could speak Greek. But they had come to Jerusalem. Now, you will notice that the bulk of the core believers were those Jews, Hebrews, who were in Israel, who were living in Israel. So they knew themselves. More. The others were like strangers in their midst. So, you find that there is this natural tendency to attend to the face you know quicker than the face you don't know. It happens. And people say, eh, they, they, are, they are the partial in that church. That's what was beginning to happen. I don't know. Eh, we went there, all of us, so before you know, that one, because she knows uh, Peter. They gave her quick, quick. My own desire should come tomorrow. <laughs> no man natural disagreements. I still remember a church I pastor. The very first church I pastor. I noticed that there were divisions we were beginning to scrape into the church. And I was praying and wondering what to do. Then we went to camp. 
when we got to camp that the Jew gave us papers, questionnaire, and asked us to answer questions about our provincial pastor, our senior pastors, anything he said, even including that Jew, anything that the Jew is doing, you don't like, write it. As I was feeling that thing, I said, this is what I'm going to go back and do in my church. So when I got back to my church, I designed a form address. I said, don't write your name. Because anything I'm doing, you don't like, write it there. Anything any of the ministers is doing, anything in the church, you don't like, write it down. Don't put your name. People wrote all kinds of things. I was shocked. Some of the things who wrote about me, I couldn't even believe. And I liked it. But I remember one of my ministers, he said, ah, ah, Jonathan, how can you handle this kind of something? He said, me, I can't handle it. I said, ah, if you want to grow, you must learn. It's better they tell you that you send it behind your back and the devil will be killing them. But there was one sister who wrote something. She said there is too much tribalism in this church. See, this church is too tribal. And the pastor only listened to some group of people. Unfortunately, unfortunately for her, because God wanted to help her. I knew her writing. Immediately I read it, I knew who she was. In fact, many of the people who wrote it, I knew who they were. Because it was a small church. Some of the things, by the way they were talking, I could say, this is the person that will write it. This one must be this one. So I took my time, explained what I could explain, gathered everybody. What I could explain, I explained. Some people had decided to start calling them one by one. And those I needed to apologize to. But by the time I was true, love and unity was restored. But that particular sister, this is where I'm going, that said they were two tribal in the church. She is a married woman. I will not mention the tribe in Delta. And these people, they don't joke with infidelity. A married woman is not even supposed to shake the hand of a man in their culture. But she and one brother in the church that they are the same language. That one is not married. They are always singing special number in their language in the church. And she was the one complaining that there is too much tribalism in the church. And I told her, I called her. I said, see me, I'm from Benue. My wife is Yoruba. My assistant is Igbo. His wife is Yoruba. There's another brother, he's Yoruba. The wife is from Akwaibo. I mentioned like that. How can this kind of church be tribal? He said, every time they gather among themselves, the Yoruba people, they'll be speaking their language, speaking their language. I say, you, a married woman, and I say, you and this brother, you are going out. He said, hey, Pastor, can you say? I said, you are going out. Something is between two of you. He said, I suspect two of you very well. He said, ah, Pastor. I, I, even if somebody say that kind of thing, I say, but why are you always singing together? She said, it's just, I said, hey, your own is not tribalism, but their own is tribalism. <laughs> that was when she understood where I was going. And I told her, I said, you see this crowd? If we are in a crowd, we're in Delta here, we're in a crowd, and I'm the only person that speaks my language here. If I say, everybody lift your voice and pray, if one person speaks my language in that congregation, I will hear it. It's not true. I said, there's something special about language. Don't be too quick to accuse people. I'm just talking about normal disagreements that spring up in churches. And if you don't deal with it, if you don't deal with it quickly, sometimes people just assume things. They just assume. And there is nothing there. Nothing. Just nothing. And you know in Nigeria, we especially this issue of tribalism and ethnicity, because the society is so tribal, especially the politicians, they have used tribe. And I'm telling you, those politicians, you see, are, many of them, they are not tribal. You see many of them, they are wild, they from another place. They are, but when they need votes, they use tribal sentiments to use, to they make us, they elevate tribes so much. Because I look at it, the common Nigerian, we intermarry, we live peaceably, we do business with one another. But when it comes to politics, they start elevating those political something, elevating tribe, elev so that even in the church, many, many times, people begin to bring up these tribal things. And if you are not careful, people will deceive you into following them in the name of tribe. When the Bible says clearly that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is no Hebrew. Acts, but you saw it there, it was in Acts chapter 6. So if it happened then, don't be surprised if it happened today.
but they quickly nipped it in the bud. They set up a committee to begin to address those issues. So offenses will come. Offenses will come. In Acts chapter 15, the whole of that chapter was another situation. This time it was on doctrinal matters. Disagreement. Believers, genuine believers. Some say everybody must be circumcised. Some say no. Huh? It's not circumcision that is making us to be saved now. So why am I going to force people who are not Jews to be circumcised? Christ. I know that those arguments are the same arguments we are making to you today. In their own case, they sat down, they deliberated on it, came to agreement, and took a decision. And settled the quarrel. But when you get towards the end of that chapter, Acts chapter 15, 36 to 40, Acts 15, 36 to 40, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement about this, their servant, John Mark. In the end, they said the disagreement was so sharp that they couldn't reconcile, so they parted. They didn't part out of marriage. That's something I want you to understand. Because later you will hear the same Paul writing, bring Mark to me, I need him. It was a disagreement. Also, since we can't agree, we are, go, I pray for you, God will go with you. I'll look for another person. You, you carry him and go, but me, I'm not going to allow that boy. He will discourage this great problem for us on the way. So sometimes, we, we used to have this principle when we were on campus. We say we must agree to disagree. We must disagree respectfully. That's why those of us who, who attended fellowship on campus, we have some behaviors, especially those of us who are leaders, and we have learned some principles that are still following us, even as in ministry. You know, sometimes many of you look at me and feel me and too. I don't enforce authority too much. It's because I'm used to leadership that is participatory. I'm used to leadership where even though you are the overall leader, you don't, you don't just run, run on people's heads to achieve results. We'll go for executive meeting and when I bring up an issue as a president, this one will rise up and say, no, we are not going to do it that way. That one will rise up and say, this one will quote this Bible passage. And sometimes when we can't agree, we'll say, okay, let's close this meeting. Let's go and fast and pray. We'll come back tomorrow. Or we'll come back next week. We used to do that. And you know, when we leave that meeting, the brother that was fighting me most is the one that will come and say, hey, bros, what do you get for your room? Are they hungry? <laughs> Whoever has food, we all go and converge there and eat that food. Even in the course of that, if anybody raises, no, no, don't, don't bring that matter here. We agree that we should go and pray and meet next week. You understand? So, we have learned that you can disagree over a matter. Doesn't mean that you and that person has a disagreement. I said, when we are going to Joss, we should take bus. And that person, no, say no. Because of the level of insecurity today, everybody go and enter public transport and go. It's a disagreement. It doesn't mean that me and you have a problem. The issue is that there's a matter on ground that we have not agreed upon. We are not hating each other. We are not fighting each other. But there's a matter we have not agreed upon. That's something that believers need to learn. That's something believers need to learn. Unfortunately, some of these things, even unbelievers, understand it. Sometimes you see these politicians arguing, 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 insulting each other. Later they will say, ah, that one is just campaign. You will see them eating in the same place after they campaign. You see, they will say that one, that, 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 that is just campaign. I was surprised, I will not mention him. One prominent politician that was inf- insulting a former president. He recently now say, ah, that was one of the best presidents. And some ah, but you were insulted, say, ah, that one was campaign now. That is campaign stock. You don't take campaign matter serious. I say, eh? Meanwhile, people died because of that talk. So, as believers, we should trash issues. Leave personalities aside. Now, why do offenses come from our sinful nature? This is even the most serious one from our sinful nature. James 3, verse 14 to 17. James 3, 14 to 17. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. 
This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. You know, it said that this thing is not from above. So if it's not from above, where is it from? It is from earth. It's sensual. Sensual is from our inner mind, inside us, inside our old nature. There were other Bible passages we had read before, you know, that emphasize that James 4 verse 1, James 4 verse 1, from whence come wars and fighters among you, come they not thence, hence, even of your lust that war in your members, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, leaves the work of the flesh. You will see strife, wrath is there, hatred. There are works of the flesh. Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Romans 16, 17 and 18. You will find it there. These are things that don't come from God. They come from our fallen nature. They come from our fallen nature. We have read before in Titus 3, verse 3, you know, talking about how that before before we got born again, before we became children of God, we were foolish, we were deceived, we were living in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. That's old life. So when you find that in manifestation in the church, it is not a godliness, it's not a spirit of godliness that is producing that. It is the old sinful nature that is producing those things in our midst. But where the spirit of the Lord is, there is love, there is unity, there is righteousness, there is peace. Is joy in the Holy Ghost. So it comes from our. That's why, if you remember last week when somebody asked about why it's difficult to forgive, one of the things I said was that the, 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 the reason we find it difficult to forgive is because of, it's rooted in our old nature. It's rooted in our old nature. We feel, we feel that to forgive means we have lost. That means we have debilitated ourselves. That means we have ins- allowed us to be insulted without a reply. You know, when somebody insults you and don't reply, it's like you have lost. <laughs> he has won, you lost. I said he scored a goal against you. And in this, in this game, he, you must not lose. You do me, I do you. It must end in either a draw game or I will win against you. If you insult my mama, I will insult your mama and your papa plus your grandparents. Join. <laughs> so, we, we must win. It's not rooted in our holiness nature, but it's in our old nature. But sometimes in the midst of this, what we don't do is that we don't see the devil. In the midst of this, we don't see the devil at all because he hides in our fleshly nature. But if you look at that, uh, James chapter 3, verse, verse 15. James 3, says, This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. James hit the nail on the head. At the back of all this is the devil. It's a devil that creates offenses to destabilize the flock of God, to destabilize the church of God. Because where there is offense, you read that, it says, where there is, the sister says, for where ending and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. You find that even among believers, when you allow envy, strife, anger, bitterness, anything can happen there, including killings. You know, when you hear that, they hired assassins, men of God, to kill another man of God. You ask yourself, what happened? You know, anger. Anger is, is intoxicating. We call it madness. You can make someone mad for months, for years. He will no longer be in his senses. He will not even know what he's doing. You imagine a man kill his wife. That he, he married the day he proposed to her. He said, I love you. How did he end up killing that woman? Anger. Madness. It's no longer in thinking. It's no longer in his senses. It's no longer in control. Same thing can happen in the house of God. You see, believers 
begin to wish each other evil. Instead of standing by one another, we begin to fight each other. I still remember a church I pastored. I will not mention the church. And one day we were on the altar, many pastors. I said, we should hold our hands. Pray. Every enemy standing in the way of my progress. Fire! Holy Ghost, fire! When we finish, I turned to one of the... Okay, I think that day, what happened was, as we were going back to the office, one of the senior pastors said he wanted to drink water, that to give him water from my office. I said, I don't have water in my office. He said, but they're supposed to be putting, buying water for your office. I said, nobody has given me water since I came. He said, ah, ah. You mean these boys have not been giving you water? I said, nobody has ever given me water. If I'm thirsty, I go and drink in my house. My house is not far from the church. So, and I talked to him, joking you, I was joking, honestly, I was joking. I said, you see now, we just held our hands on the altar. We say, anyone that is standing on the way of anything that belongs to the late fire, you see, you see, this boy don't know that this water that they use giving fire can fall there too. Because it's my entitlement, if it's my entitlement that you are not giving me, and you say, we should hold our hands and pray that Holy Ghost fire, Holy Ghost fire. Do you know that? The person I was talking to was actually the one blocking me from getting what I was supposed to get. So, the following day, accounts department called me to come and sign for some money. I said, what? What is it? They said, no, it's money we are supposed to give you since, but so-so person said we should hold on yet. Ah, I said, this is my prayer yesterday. God answered it to me. <laughs> You say, what am I talking? You say, sometimes it's in the house of God and people are... And here we are praying, fire, Holy Ghost, fire, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. If God will answer those Holy Ghost fire prayers, all of them, the burning that will take place in the house of God, because we are fighting each other, standing in the way of each other, blocking each other, envying each other, for no reason. For no reason. <laughs> It's the devil that is causing all those things. So that instead of being united against the devil, we are turned and we are fighting each other and he can continue to wreak havoc in the body of Christ. You know, sometimes I, I cast my mind back. When we got born again, when we come to fellowship, youth, secondary school, university, if we come together, we will hold our hands and we pray. Forget it. You will see answers. I still remember 100 level. We had this chemistry teacher that was a stubborn guy. His house was very close to the primary school where we used to do fellowship. So he said we had, our prayers are disturbing him. So he will fix lecture during the time of fellowship. And we say we are not going to attend that lecture. You have morning till evening. It's in the night. 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. to go and fix lecture. You say you are busy. Then he will put tests. You see, radical young boys. We didn't go for the test. We went to fellowship. After fellowship, there was an announcement. All the people who are doing social course wait behind. We held our hand. We said we cancel that test in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't go and copy those kind of things. You don't know what you are doing. No. Those who wrote the test, everybody failed. He came very angry. All of you, these children, you are useless. You are down dunces. This, 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 this. With everything I've taught you, nobody could even score anything. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll do another test. And we prayed. We say, if he fixes it during that time, we will still not do that test. So he fixes it at the, another time. Is it that somebody is sick? We gather to pray. No, forget it. That person is getting up. But these days, why? We fasting in the church. We gather and pray. Nothing. Why? Too much division. Too much envy and bitterness. Even among the leaders in the church. We don't know that it's a devil that is destroying us. Making us powerless. Making us empty. See the situation of a country like Nigeria. If one pastor announces that we should pray and fast, some people will rise up and insult that pastor very well. Instead of mobilizing people to go to the streets to go and protest 
you are saying that you should pray and fast. And when we say you should vote so so person, you refuse. Now you are asking us to go and pray. We are not coming to, to, to pray. So we will say, Pastor, so we come and say, God doesn't answer to such prayers. <laughs> pray first now. Leave the answer to the God that answers prayer now. So the devil is behind divisions in the body of Christ. I want to round up today. Like I said, next week, God giving us grace we will look in detail how can we walk in forgiveness the topic will be the, the act of forgiveness but today in conclusion God has promised to deal ruthlessly with those who bring offenses to the church so even though we are talking about it as if it's a normal thing God does not accept it as a normal thing he said woe unto you to whom they come he said, offenses will come, oh, there's nothing you can do. He said, but the person that brings it, woe unto him. A woe means <laughs> danger unto him. Trouble unto him. And look at the description. He said, it is better for him that a millstone will hang on his neck and he is cast into the sea than he should offend a child of God. To offend in that case is to cause him to stumble, to cause him to derail. If your offense makes another child of God to derail, ah, uh, it will trouble his face so that he's no longer focusing on God. And I don't know what is better than if you put a new stone on somebody's neck and you drop into the sea, what will happen? That's the end now. The only thing is that he's there to be quick. So that's the only thing. The only, the only thing is that if they throw you inside without the new stone, you will still die. Oh. But you will die a more slow, a more painful one because the flood will carry you, carry you, carry you, carry you, carry you. Eventually you will die. But this one, you will die quickly. So that's the only reason why he says it's better. Means God will deal ruthlessly. So what do I do? You have to make up your mind not to be a source of offense. That's a choice that every believer needs to make. God helping me, I've made up my mind. I don't mind being offended, but me, I don't want to offend you. Romans 12, verse 18. Romans 12, 18. If it be possible, as much as light in you, live peaceably with all men. As much as it depends on you. Because there are some things that don't depend on you. For example, if I have to choose between pleasing a man and pleasing God, I will please God. So in that kind of situation, I will offend you. Because it's no longer in my control. But if it depends on me, if it is about my actions alone, I must make sure that my actions are actions of peace. Romans 14 verse 13. Romans 14 verse 13. Let us therefore judge one another. Not, let us not therefore judge any. Uh, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather. That no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Don't let by your action make another child of God to stumble or fall. It should not be you. It should not be you. Hebrews 12 verse 14. Hebrews 12 14. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men. All men. All men. All. There is all. Follow peace with all. Believers, unbelievers, follow peace. Don't be the one to go to court quickly. Don't be the one to stay at strife. Choose the path of peace. Always. Don't initiate, participate, or promote offenses. Don't let people recruit you to join them in creating troubles. You know, there are things I see people write on social media that are quite fine. He says some people make an enemy. You don't know why they became enemies. They come and recruit you. 
to join them to become an enemy to someone you don't know. You have never met the person and you hate the person. And I realized that thing one time. There was one particular pastor. People had told me so many negative stories about him. So the day I, I, I met him, I realized that I just had this cold feeling towards him. But by the time he had finished preaching, and I interacted with him a little bit, I said, but this man doesn't look like what... Then I started talking to myself. It was also a person that told you that. That one told you that. Even though you didn't take it seriously then, but it was seeping into your heart. You know, sometimes people are telling you stories. It's just like, it's just... But unconsciously, it's seeping into your heart, seeping into your heart. And before you know, you start reacting towards some people based on what people have told you. Don't do it. Don't join them. Sometimes, something you have not verified, because people told you about people, you too, you start spreading... Ah, that man is like this, is like this, like this. But the day you are here to, I know it was also a person that said it to that one too. Said no, it was also a person. Meanwhile, you have you were relating the matter as if you were there, as if you are hundred percent sure. It is so terrible. The pastor told me a story. Of how two pastors sat and were talking about a man of God, and the other one was telling, Ah, you see that motor he has? Ah, eh. if I tell you how he got that car, it will shock you. This is what it is. This is what it is. Now, the person that was overhearing them knows this other person very well. He said, At a point, he just came to them and said, Thank you very much, two of you. I've heard all people you said about so far, so so and so. That motor you are talking about, I am the one that bought it for him. Look at the problem. I woke, they were embarrassed. <laughs> and the other one was telling that a, a rumor, a rumor, a fake story. These days, they will just generate a fake story, they will write it, knowing it's false, and believers, without even praying. To hear in their spirit whether what they are saying is correct or not, they are sharing, sharing, sharing. They already started commenting, sharing, commenting, sharing, liking, you know, spreading it. Don't initiate, don't participate, don't promote offenses. That's why in I think Philippians 4 verse 8, Philippians 4 verse 8, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, whatever, think on these things. What you have not verified, even if you verify it. Is the Holy Spirit asking you to write this? You know, when God started dealing with me about social media, if I see that I want to correct people, he said, Did I ask you to correct them? One day I didn't listen. I tried to correct you to see the way they insulted me. And the Holy Spirit said, to say, You deserve the insult. People are talking on their wall. Who sent you go there? They did their house, they talk. You, you went there to go and chuck your mouth inside. It was good. They saw it to the need to go and they could see you physically and beat you up. It would have been good for you. So after that, if I don't like what you are writing, I, I unfriend you. So I don't see what you post. I've unfriended several people this last that today I unfriended one person today. Because for some weeks I've been seeing her post things that I don't like to see. I've unfriended them. For, your, for your information, if I hear anybody sharing all those preaching that uh, um, what Paul said was wrong, immediately I see that I will friend you. I don't want to hear it. So you, you are holier than Paul. You now know that Paul was wrong. It's you that is Nigeria today that is the true apostle of God. You are the one that God is talking to. You know that Paul, Paul that made Jesus, Paul made a mistake. What Paul said was not correct. Is what you are saying today that is correct. We should listen to you. I don't listen to them again. It doesn't matter which that man of God is. It doesn't matter you are knowing to the miracles you are doing. Once I hear you say, uh, Paul was wrong. So if Paul was wrong, now when I'm reading the Bible, maybe tomorrow now another person will say Peter was wrong. Another day they will say James was wrong. Another person they will say John was wrong. So who are we? Which, which part of the Bible is not correct? 
another day and they will not tell you. This thing that they say Jesus said, he actually didn't say it. That's where he's going to go to now. Don't participate. Can we rise up for a minute, cry to God and say, Father, give me grace not to create offense in your heart. Give me grace. Give me grace, Lord.